This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. According to a United Nations report, the death toll in Iraq during the month of October has reached a new high of 3,709. This is 350 more deaths than in September. In addition, more than 1 million Iraqis have been displaced since the United States-led invasion in Iraq. The report confirmed that many victims' bodies have shown signs of trauma and torture as well as execution-style killing. The death toll and the number of displaced in Iraq has reached alarming levels, setting new records every day. Iraqi civilians, regardless of their ethnicity or religious creed, have been the targets of violent crimes. ويضاف إلى القتل والجرحى مئات الآلاف الذين أصبحوا يعانون من الاكتئاب والأمراض النفسانية التي لا تجد علاجا في وضع يتأزم يوما بعد يوم ويفتقر إلى أبسط الضمانات المطلوبة. Fearing for their lives, many Iraqi civilians fled their homes and many others emigrated out of the country. Moreover, hundreds of Iraqi civilians have shown signs of depression and psychological trauma. The UN report says that more than two million Iraqis have fled their homes. More than than 100,000 Iraqis, including scientists and academics, emigrate out of the country every month, heading to Jordan and Syria. The number of Iraqi nationals living in Jordan and Syria currently stands at 1.6 million. Meanwhile, the death toll in Iraqi countries continues to climb, and it had reached a record high in October. According to the UN report, October's civilian death toll of 3,709 was up by 350 from the September toll. In addition, more than half a million Iraqis have been displaced, especially in the aftermath of last year's Samara incident. <laughs> We return to God who created us. Praise the Lord. The Iraqi capital Baghdad was the epicenter of the violence, which claimed more than 5,000 lives during the months of September and October. Many of the victims' bodies have shown signs of torture and marks of deep wounds. The UN Human Rights Report said that most of the killing was carried out by Iraqi militias and death squads. According to a report published in the Lancet magazine, more than 650,000 Iraqis have been killed since the U.S.-led occupation of Iraq. We are now joined from New York by our correspondent Khalid Daoud. Khalid, in what context was this U.N. report prepared? The UN issues an annual report on Iraqi human rights conditions in the aftermath of the US-led occupation in Iraq and the changes that have followed. What distinguishes this report is that it includes higher death toll numbers than other reports published by US and other media outlets. Will this report have political effects on the United Nations policies, or is it merely citing high figures of killed and displaced Iraqis? This report complements the UN position, which criticizes the Iraqi security situation that has been deteriorating since the US-led occupation more than three years ago. In addition, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan criticized the US war strategy in Iraq, saying it seems that the American forces are trapped in Iraq. 
The UN report, which has a high level of credibility in the world, brings a humiliation to the U.S. administration that it claims to be achieving progress in Iraq. The Iraqi Central Bank adopted a new mechanism to help boast the financial sector that has been staggering due to the deteriorating security situation. This new mechanism will help resolve some of the country's financial problems, such as the soaring inflation rates. Samara Mahmoud reports. The Iraqi Central Bank has adopted a new strategy to help resolve some of the country's financial problems, such as rising inflation rates. It examines some of the factors attributing to the rise of inflation rates, which have been slowing down the economy in general and the financial market in particular. In addition, soaring inflation rates have a negative impact on low-income families and affect their living standards. أن الاقتصاد العراقي تأثر سلبا بالظروف الأمنية وهذا ناجم عن مصدرين الأول اختناقات العرض في القطاع الحقيقي According to a source affiliated with the Iraqi Central Bank the deteriorating security situation in Iraq has negatively impacted the economy The supply of fuel has been declining due to the rise of costs of production and shipping The consumer price index, market purchasing power and the overall demand of consumer products and services have also attributed to soaring inflation rates The Central Bank, which has examined the overall economic policy and its own financial financial policy believes that some of the factors affecting the inflation rates can be resolved by adopting new economic and financial mechanisms. If not addressed and resolved, the financial and market problems caused by rising inflation rates may lead to further deterioration of the economy. The central bank should analyze the current market conditions in order to identify the financial problems and provide the appropriate solutions. Meanwhile, the central bank will do its part of trying to resolve the problems attributed to rising inflation rates by adopting a new tight financial policy. It will try to improve the market value of the Iraqi dinar and its purchasing power as well as making it more attractive to investors. By doing so, it will make the Iraqi dinar, which has been increasingly losing value against the U.S. dollar, more attractive to investors. The popularity of the U.S. dollar in the Iraqi market is considered to be one of the most stringent challenges facing the Iraqi financial institutions, which are trying to combat inflation. Furthermore, the central bank intends to encourage short- and long-term investments by offering loans at attractive interest rates. These new measures by the central bank will help restore consumers' confidence in the financial market, which will boost the staggering economy and hopefully recharge the reconstruction efforts in the country. وتحقيق النمو المطلوب سمارة محمود السومرية the Ministry of Youth and Sports organized the National Reconciliation Arts and Culture Exhibit in Karbala. Twelve provinces in central and southern Iraq took part in the exhibit. Imam Bilal has the details. Under the banner of Our Culture is the Source of Our Unity, the National Reconciliation Arts and Culture Exhibit was inaugurated in Karbala. It was organized by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Some 12 provinces in central and southern Iraq took part in the exhibit. The Ministry of Youth and Sports was asked to support Iraqi youth from north to south by organizing more cultural events, especially since art affects the youth more. Our youth needs to take part in events, festivals and sports activities that provide them with the opportunity to meet other youth from Salah Adin, Karbala, Arbil, Ramadi and al Hilla. Thank God we will always be united and we will get rid of terrorism. The participants expressed their ideas about the National Reconciliation Project through their paintings and in their own special ways. They are presenting poetry and displaying art to reflect on their national unity and national reconciliation. This is what the paintings embody. Also, the verses of the poems talk about unity and fraternity and rejection of sectarianism and racism. Many organizations and provinces took part in the event to foster national unity. Al-Hindiya Youth Center contributed several works, including sculptures 
sculptures and works of art that reflect national interest. This is where I serve as the art director. The National Reconciliation Project is still forging ahead. The Iraqis are trying to push it forward until Iraq is once again safe and secure. Iman Bilal, As-Somaria, Karbala. The beleaguered town of Stairo today buried another one of its residents killed in a Qassam rocket attack. 43-year-old Yaakov Yakobov was critically injured yesterday when a Qassam rocket struck the factory he was working in. He succumbed to his injuries and died overnight at Soroka Hospital in Beersheba. Relatives of the victim today spoke out against the lack of security in their area. Yakobov's brother has called on both Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and Defense Minister Amir Peretz to resign their posts. Five Qassam rockets fired by terrorists exploded today in the western Negev with a near miss to a school in the beleaguered town of Steyrot, causing shock to a dozen or more students. Meanwhile, an IDF soldier was moderately wounded as the Army staged a wide-scale operation aimed at countering the rocket fire. We get more on this report from IBA's Dennis Sen. At around 8 this morning, Palestinian terrorists fired another barrage of Qassam rockets at the western Negev. One slammed into the ground just outside a schoolyard minutes before the lesson started, causing panic amongst the pupils. Several were treated for shock. Worried parents rushed back to the school to make sure their children were safe. Town residents are angry over their predicament and said that the government has abandoned their security. The morning rocket attack came less than 24 hours after Sterot resident Yaakov Yakobov was killed by a Qassam while on duty at the chicken packing factory where he worked. In these pictures captured by the plant's security camera, we see how workers ran for safety at the sound of the town's approaching missile warning system. Yaakov was a little slow to enter the safe area and was fatally injured by a rocket that smashed through the roof of the factory. Fellow workers said that they have no doubt that the Red Dawn siren prevented a mass tragedy at the site. Soon after the attack, a small idea force moved into the northern Gaza Strip to try and stop further launches. This while waiting for the decision of the morning security cabinet meeting. Sporadic gun battles erupted as Palestinian gunmen tried to prevent the incursion. One IDF soldier was moderately injured by an anti-tank rocket and had to be airlifted to Soroka Hospital in Beersheba. An officer in the Southern Command said lessons from the Lebanon war are being put into practice by terror groups in Gaza. He said that the Qassam attacks are now more accurate and are thus taking more of a toll than they did in the past. And he revealed that the Palestinians are using more sophisticated anti-armor rockets than before and can now inflict more damage. The officer said that a thorough cleanup of the northern Gaza Strip is needed to reduce the terrorists' ability to carry out attacks. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. Our reporter adds that one Palestinian gunman was killed by IDF troops operating in Gaza. According to a military spokesman, the man was shot while launching a rocket. The Security Cabinet convened to discuss ways of combating the ongoing Palestinian firing of Qassam rockets into Israel. No significant declarations came out of more than two hours of deliberations. For the time being, ministers failed to take dramatic steps to counter the rocket fire, opting instead to maintain the current policy of deterrence. Cabinet ministers appear to be split between pressing for a large-scale offensive in the Gaza Strip and the option of seeking a long-term diplomatic solution. Defense Minister Parrott said the IDF will continue carrying out operations in the Gaza Strip, including some on a larger scale than those conducted so far. Parrott also instructed defense officials to expedite the examination of rocket interception systems. Ministers pushed for the establishment of a local headquarters to assist residents of communities surrounding Gaza. In other news, two Italians working for the International Red Cross were released by Palestinian terrorists after being kidnapped yesterday in Gaza. In response to the kidnapping, the ICRC announced a suspension of operations for an indefinite period of time. Gunmen grabbed Claudio Moroni and Gianmarco Ornato from their car near the town of Khan Yunus and held them for about eight hours. 
They were released unharmed after PA security officials made contact with the kidnappers. No group claimed responsibility for carrying out the action. The Red Cross has ordered its workers to leave its offices only in order to provide aid in life-threatening situations. It is a kidnapping and for us it is, a, it is a grave situation that Red Cross workers who are protected by Geneva Conventions to carry out humanitarian works are kidnapped is very grave and we are concerned. Uh, so it is not something we take lightly. Instead of celebrating Independence Day, Lebanon mourned the death of Christian community leader and cabinet minister Pierre Jamal. He was assassinated yesterday in a Beirut suburb. Jamal's assassination, the fifth murder of an anti-Syrian politician in two years, threatens to push the country toward civil war. IBA's Leah Stern brings us more in this story. What was supposed to be Lebanon's Independence Day turned into a somber occasion as the country mourned the death of slain industry minister Pierre Jamayel. Thousands of people marched through Jamayel's hometown of Bekfaya, raising pictures of him and throwing rice at his coffin draped in his Christian Falange party flag. Jamal's funeral, expected to attract tens of thousands of people, will take place tomorrow. Just 34 years old and a devout Christian, Jamal was killed Tuesday in a carefully orchestrated assassination when two cars blocked his vehicle at an intersection in the suburbs of Beirut. An unidentified gunman then shot him numerous times through a side window of his car. Jamal's assassination was the fifth murder of an anti-Syrian Lebanese politician in nearly two years and threatens to push Lebanon, already in a political crisis, over the edge. On today's front page of a popular Lebanese newspaper, the headline read, The blood of the martyred young minister covers the streets and reveals that the dangers facing Lebanon are even graver than the fears many express. According to Lebanese President Amil Lahoud, Jamal's murder is part of a conspiracy that began with the February 2005 assassination of former Prime Minister Rafi Kariri. And Lebanese Prime Minister Fouad Sinora said, we will not let the murderers control the fate of Lebanon. Jamal's blood will not go in vain. Meanwhile, police investigating the murder say that they have little to report. Syria has condemned the killing and denies any involvement. But Lebanese Christians and recent history points an accusing finger at Damascus. This is Leah Stern for IBA News. Residents of Beirut and its suburbs did not hear the sounds of the assassination. It was a silent crime against a minister who was surrounded by security detail. The crime was carried out by armed assailants who were not afraid to reveal their faces on a street crowded with residents and cars. After the assailants shot at the Minister of Industry, Pierre Gameyil, they got out of the car they were driving to make sure that he had died. Rima Maktabi has the details. November 21st would not be a normal day for Widad Aoun. She was preparing to walk to the other side of this street, but a chaotic incident caught her attention. I was standing on the street. I saw that two cars had crashed into each other. One stopped sideways in front of the other. Then there was gunfire. I stopped and froze. One guy came, looking around at the ground, then he started firing. The car of the Lebanese Minister of Industry, Pierre Jamayel, was passing on the street when two cars stopped it. According to security analysts, the assailants fired at Minister Jamayel's car from behind. Then, two assailants got out of a Honda CRV, walked towards the minister's car, and shot at it. I was asleep inside my home. I heard unusual noises outside. Then I heard a loud noise. I heard four or five gunshots, though they are saying that they use silencers. But I did not know. I went outside and I didn't see anything. See how the cars are standing there right now? That is what I saw. Then the people began gathering around. I saw the person driving the car. 
Was he still alive? No, 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 no. I didn't think he was alive at all, because his head was leaning to one side and blood was coming out of it. Nothing else was showing. Everything from here was blasted through from one side. According to witnesses, the criminals were not wearing masks on their faces. According to security analysts, this means that the perpetrators did not carry out the assassination for financial reasons, rather because they have strong political convictions. Reports indicate that the authorities have many witnesses, most importantly, the driver of this blue car who accidentally crashed into the minister's car, as well as a second man who was with Minister Jamail and who was in the backseat of the car. In addition, they have business store owners who saw what happened. Security analysts speculate that the escape route of the two criminal cars may have been either the Rumi Road or the Belda Road. However, this road also leads to Beirut and even Kastwan. The wounded victims waited about 20 minutes for the ambulance to arrive. Minister Pierre Jmail lost a lot of blood from the wounds he sustained to his head and stomach before he died. Thus, in the light of day and on one of the most crowded streets of this Beirut suburb, armed assailants shot at this car belonging to Minister Pierre Jamel from behind, killing him. A silent crime that has shaken the nation. These are two of the many possible assassination scenarios. قرابة الثالثة والنصف بالتوقيت المحلي لمدينة بيروت كان الوزير والنائب Approximately at 3.30 p.m. Beirut time, Parliament member and Minister of Industry Pierre Jmail was coming back from a funeral procession that was held in Qandusiya Rita Church in New Jadid in northern Beirut. While he was driving his Kia car, a black four-wheel Honda followed him. The black Honda had tourist license plates, but later it turned out that the plates were forged. كان في داخلها ثلاثة أشخاص تتجاوزه السيارة ثم The first assassination scenario goes like this. The black Honda with three individuals on board passes Pierre's car and suddenly stops in front of him. Pierre hits the car from behind and one of the Honda passengers gets out and walks toward the driver's door where Minister Jmail is sitting. He fires 24 bullets from a gun equipped with a silencer. The man who is sitting next to Pierre is fatally wounded. The third man, who is accompanying Jmail, panics gets out of the car and lays down on the ground. The black Honda then leaves with the perpetrators in three possible directions. Romana Babdat through the new highway or west toward the coastal road leading to Beirut. The second assassination scenario goes like this. Jmail's Kia car is hit from behind, forcing it to slow down dramatically. Then the black Honda passes him and stops right in front of him. And then one of the perpetrators opens fire directly towards the driver's window with a gun equipped with a silencer. The minister then tries to escape and hits the black Honda from behind. At that point, one of the perpetrators gets out of the Honda and shoots Jmail, hitting him directly in the head. He also injures the man that was sitting with Jmail, who later dies of sustained injuries. Tehran slammed Paris on Wednesday for its baseless claims over Iran's interfering in Lebanon's internal affairs. Iran's Foreign Ministry spokesman Mohamed Ali Hosseini condemned the French Foreign Ministry remarks, saying the comments run counter to the prevailing realities in Lebanon and stem from the biased and interventionist spirit of French officials. It further said Paris is exacerbating the political crisis in the region by ignoring Lebanese will, something that Tehran regards as vital in its relations with Beirut. Dozens of U.S. peace activists joined thousands of South Korean workers and farmers on Wednesday to demonstrate against South Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. The protesters shouting anti-U.S. and anti-Bush slogans such as 
bush get out of the earth. The demonstrators were also holding red and white posters denouncing the FDA and imports of U.S. beef. I feel very ashamed of my country. I, oh, I think that free trade agreements, uh, military expansion, imperialism, uh, militarism, they're what killed my son. And not only do we have to work against war, but we have to work against the things that lead to war and oppress people. I think the Korean people should know that the Bush administration does not represent the views of the majority of the people of the United States, especially the workers, and that we want to make sure the free trade agreement does not pass. We want to make sure that both the United States and Korea pull their troops out of Iraq and that the kind of agreements we have should be agreements that are good for workers, for the environment, and for peace. قال الرئيس الإيراني محمود The Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said that his country will be able to secure sufficient nuclear fuel to operate its nuclear installations by the beginning of 2007. During an exclusive interview with Al Alam Television, the Iranian President undermined the effects of possible sanctions on his country and called on all sides to sit at the negotiation table. عقوبات خفيفة وأخرى ثقيلة. The United Nations Security Council is debating whether to impose light or heavy sanctions on Iran. Others are threatening with a military strike, and only a few are calling for calming down the situation. This is how one can describe the current situation surrounding Iran's nuclear program. But what do the Iranians have to say about this? One of Iran's priorities is to build thousands of nuclear fusion systems in order to secure the necessary nuclear energy in a step-by-step -step process. We intend to build 60,000 central fusion systems so Iran can secure the needed nuclear fuel within a year. In the first stage, 3,000 systems will be built and we will proceed step by step so we can develop nuclear energy. What is interesting is that the Iranian people are no longer preoccupied with the sanctions which generated a big confusion in the capitals of prominent countries since last August. News about possible sanctions are viewed as rumors aimed at weakening their country's will to develop nuclear energy which Tehran seems to be determined to achieve at this time. They can't do anything. These are only psychological threats intended for propaganda. I don't think that they will do anything special except for hurt themselves and their country's interests. Everyone believes that Iran holds the key to stability in the region. Everyone also knows that there will be consequences for meddling with this key. Iran, however, has another point of view. It believes that America is drowning in the Iraqi and Afghan quagmires and that the Israeli entity is suffering from internal crisis. Therefore, they will not dare attack Iran at least for the time being. Many are wondering why the West refuses to negotiate with Iran while knowing that their sanctions will not work and that the military option will be very costly. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.